Speedrunners thrive on broken games. Where others see hassle and disappointment, runners see opportunity. Pushing the game to its limits is par for the course. Imagine finding your game's holy grail, the glitch that breaks the run wide open, but your game is basically on round-the-clock life support. When you're always one wrong move away from a run-killing game crash, is it worth it? Quick, someone get the crash cart. Jack 2 is coding again. The Jack series is no stranger to huge glitches that save a ton of time. Whereas the original game steadily lowered the time down over 20 years with new discoveries, the biggest trick in Jack 2 is found instantly. A perfectly predefined package for prospective players. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy though. It won't be just the metalheads that test your metal. Strap in, this Sumer has no bricks. Welcome to Speed Docs. Jack 2 was released on October 14, 2003. As the sequel to Jack and Daxter, the game was a pretty dramatic shift in gameplay. The original game was a colorful platformer that relied on puzzles and errands to collect power cells. Jack 2 is a dark and gritty gun game with flying cars and a jet board. Despite the sea change, Jack 2 is a lot of fun to play, and people remember it almost as fondly as the precursor legacy. The story follows Jack and his Otzel pal Daxter as they travel through a portal and find themselves in a new world. The enemies from the first game, Lurkers, have been replaced by Metalheads, enemies with a golden bullseye on their heads. Jack has been experimented on and now has a new ability called Dark Eco Mode. That's right, the same goo that made Daxter a fuzzy orange rodent turns Jack into a purple hulk. Their quest to find their friends and return home will lead them to a final confrontation with Kor, the leader of the Metalheads. Jack isn't going to be able to fight the enemy with just his boyish charm though, it's time to tool up. The Morph Gun is our preferred instrument of destruction. First we have the Scatter Gun, which operates like your average run-of-the-mill shotgun. Then we have the Blaster, which is a semi-automatic rifle that offers more accuracy and range. Next is the Vulcan, which has an increased rate of fire and range, in exchange for reduced power and ammo efficiency. Last we have the Peacemaker, which creates a lasting peace once everyone in your immediate area is dead. Each of these guns has two upgrades which change their abilities, but it's not too important for the speedrun. Progression in Jack 2 doesn't work the same as it did in the first game. In Jack and Daxter, the players ran around collecting power cells to unlock the next area of the game. Each hub was locked behind a power cell threshold. However, you did not need to collect the requisite number of power cells if you were able to platform through on your own. This is how tricks like Lava Tube Skip and Fire Canyon Skip are possible. Jack 2 does not work the same way. The game features a mission system similar to Grand Theft Auto. Missions are unlocked after the player completes the required missions before it. The game does its best to cordon off sections of the city, but the player essentially has access to the majority of the city from the jump. Lastly, we are covering the PS2 version of the game, unless otherwise noted. Due to a large gap in loading differences, runs are split by release of the game, with the PS3 version having its own leaderboard. Without further ado, let's get started. 
Our story starts as many do, on Speed Demos Archive. Jack and Daxter Trailblazer and noted arachnophobe Ben Fichter would be the first to try their hand at a segmented run of the game. Ben had achieved a time of 4 hours and 42 minutes and 56 segments. He starts his submission notes by saying, For starters, I am never doing a speedrun of this game again. There's a part of me that thinks at some point a person could do a speedrun of this game single segment, but then another part of me laughs and realizes it's impossible. There are just too many random things that happen in this game for that to be possible. Famous last words there, Ben. One of the things that Ben does is opt to use the single-person zoomers as much as possible. They are much faster than the two-seater ones, and it adds up quickly over nearly five hours. There are a few segments that Ben is particularly proud of, such as Protect Site in Dead Town, Destroy Equipment at Dig, and Attack the Metalhead Nest, which shine above the rest. This run isn't great. There are a lot of deaths despite being a segmented run. There is very little in the way of actual speed tech. If there was someone else interested in running the game at the time, it's likely that they would have been able to beat Ben's time. But there wasn't. Jack 2 had the potential to be cracked wide open. It just needed someone to pick up where Ben left off. Four years later, French runner Laponia 36 does a Hero Mode speedrun. Hero Mode is the game's New Game Plus mode, which gives the players an added challenge after completing the game. Starting with all your upgraded weapons and gear is huge for any speedrunner. Additionally, this run was single segment, a phenomenon Ben Fichter said would never come to pass. But the best part is the time. 1 hour, 52 minutes. Almost 3 hours faster. Here's how he did it. In the city, there are several barriers in the overworld to prevent the player from exploring the rest of the area too early. Two of these laser-activated, color-coded walls are the red and yellow barriers. You can't go through them. You can't go over them with the zoomer. You can't go under them, but you could go around them. In many older games, walls are suggestions above a certain point. Developers didn't always bother putting collision where they thought players couldn't reach. By performing a zoomer jump, jumping off the zoomer after jumping with the zoomer, Jack can get high enough to land on this pipe extending out from the building. By clipping through the walls, you can get out of bounds and roll your way to the other side of the red barrier. In a similar way, it was possible to clip out of bounds, do a death warp, and be put on the other side of the yellow barrier. These barriers are the major hindrances preventing free movement throughout the city. Skipping both of these barriers was big, but this next trick takes the cake. The Holy Grail of Jack 2 Speedrunning, Mars Tombskip. This glitch had been known about for a while, with early video and forum threads as early as 2008. Mars Tomb is an area in the final act of the game. Mars Tomb is right in the middle of the city. You can use a zoomer to get up onto these side pillars to get Jack out of bounds. You can then roll jump into where the elevator is, punch the door, and then you're in. Clip through the door to get inside the tomb, and you've skipped the first two-thirds of the game in under five minutes. Once you reach a cutscene inside Mars' tomb, the game assumes that if you have reached this point, you should have completed everything up to this area. As a safeguard, the game goes ahead and grants the player all of the previous missions, weapons you should have earned up to this point, as well as your jet board. This trick saves hours, not minutes. While this isn't an any percent run, this was the first single segment speed run that has survived to present day. It's a several hour improvement over the first any percent speed run, which is a sentence you don't hear every day. And yet his run was not infallible. Laponia died four times in his run. Not everything was neat and tidy, but it was a solid foundation for future runners to build upon. We've briefly mentioned that Jack 2 is a crash waiting to happen. And while every speedrun is a challenge, Jack 2 is just hard. The missions are difficult, enemies are out for blood, and there are no checkpoints. Failure at any point means starting the mission again from the beginning. It's an unforgiving, random game constantly in critical condition. It'd be a few years before someone else started running the game. 
these gaps weren't uncommon in the earlier days of speedrunning. There very well may have been other runs and runners that have just been lost to time, but we'll never know. All hope is not lost though. A new day was about to dawn. The streaming era was about to begin. In 2012, speedruns were huge on Twitch. Thousands of people were watching runners like Siglemic and Narcissa on a regular basis. There were fewer runners streaming, so attention was focused on just a few people. However, those runners mostly played Nintendo games. If you wanted to watch a PlayStation speedrunner back then, you were probably watching The Rixer. It's over! Yeah! Yeah! Fuck yeah! No IMG's done! Ugh! 29-34! Bitch! Get the fuck out of here! We're done with this shit! Yeah! Ho! Fucking hype, dude! Fuck yeah, man! Get the fuck in there! We are in there! If you've watched some of our past videos, you've no doubt seen his runs and heard his voice. Many more of you know him from his own speedrun videos. Unfortunately, there are a few runs that have been lost to time. There was another runner around this time playing the game as well, Crash Pro 33. Crash held the world record with the time of 2 hours, 5 minutes, and 6 seconds in 2012. If you consider that the only any percent run with surviving video evidence was posted in 2006, that Laponia's runs were hero mode and don't count, and Crash's runs are in the ether, one could say that Ricky is the man who broke Jack 2 in half. The first single segment any percent run with surviving video footage clocked in at 2.01.41 on December 22, 2012, one day after the end of the world. Here's how Ricky did it. One of the biggest things that Ricky does is make use of the jetboard more. The three major ways to navigate the game are walking, the jetboard, and zoomers. The jetboard is slightly slower than the zoomer, but faster than walking from place to place. In fact, were it not for all the NPCs and uneven terrain, the jetboard at max speed would actually be fastest. Jack can use the jetboard almost everywhere, which also gives it an edge. By shredding more and zooming less, Ricky saves time throughout the run. In the mission Destroy Eggs in Strip Mine, you're supposed to navigate this quarry-like area to slowly reach the top. By doing some clever platforming, it was possible to navigate up the side of this jagged rock face. Once runners had reached the top, they could jump up onto the top platform with the precise jetboard jump. This is Destroy Egg Skip. In the mission Destroy Drill Platform Tower, the game intends for the player to go through the level in the mech suit. The developers didn't extend the invisible wall on the side of the map far enough down, which means you can walk around the invisible wall and then walk on the edge of the map to skip a huge chunk of the level. This trick would come to be known as Drill Platform Skip. In the first part of the final mission, Break the Barrier at Nest, you're supposed to go through waves of metalhead combat to progress through the story. By jumping off of this tank, it was possible to reach a high up ledge and trigger a cutscene, which advances you to a later part of the mission. This trick is aptly named Break Barrier Skip. There is one more important thing we have to talk about. In the final fight, you battle Core. Core has multiple phases, but it's not usually considered a failure point for the speedrun. Ricky was in a position to get the first sub 2 hour time in this run. And then, the game crashed. No! No! Fuck that. Okay, I'll probably still get the record, but there goes sub two. Fucking hell! What happened? It fucking froze, dude! Oh my god, it had to fucking happen! Never forget, the biggest threat in Jack 2 is Jack 2 itself. The developers at Naughty Dog tried to really push the console to its limits for Jack 2. Because of this, the game is practically maxing out the console's resources at all times. We're not joking. It's given her all she's got, Captain, but she can't take much more. Because of this, it's very common that the game crashes from trying to do too much. There's nothing players can do about it either. These crashes, or hard locks, plagued casual players and speedrunners alike. What was once a shaggy ball of dough had begun to take shape. Glitches and tricks were being introduced which raised the difficulty significantly. 
There was certainly room for improvement. There were several tricks that Ricky failed more than a few times. As for Crash Pro, the two runners weren't exactly competing on a level playing field. There was one major difference between Crash and Ricky. Crash played on the PS3 version of the game, while Ricky played on the PS2 version. The PS3 saves 2 minutes and 19 seconds compared to the PS2, so Ricky was at a huge disadvantage. Crash was going uphill on a mountain bike, and Ricky was stuck pedaling in first gear. It was evident that Crash was playing on faster hardware specifically to get an advantage. He wasn't hiding it either. In races on Speedruns Live, he would use faster disk speed against players playing on emulators. In Crash 2 races on SRL, that would easily save you 3 to 4 minutes. Around Christmas Day, Crash lowered the record down to 148.07. Not to be outdone, Ricky came back with a 145.08 just before the end of the year. Ricky saved almost 3 minutes against a run that saves over 2 minutes in loads. That's a 5 minute improvement on the strength of Ricky's skill alone. The back and forth wouldn't end there. In early 2013, Crash improved his time first to a 139.34 and later to a 132.55. Sub 130 was in sight, and it wouldn't be long before Ricky gave it his best shot. One trick in particular helped him seal the deal and separated him from Crash. Life Seed Jump. In the mission Get Life Seed in Dead Town, you're meant to use the mech suit to traverse the level and get all the way up to the top. With the precise jetboard jump, it was possible to skip the mech suit entirely. Ricky had previously done a partial version of this trick in earlier runs, but now was eliminating the mech suit entirely. This was something that Crash had deemed too difficult, but Ricky was going for it on every attempt. Ultimately, this is what set the two runners apart. One was doing everything they could to go faster, and the other was relying on their hardware to be faster. Ricky got a 129.48 in early 2013 and proved he was the more skilled runner. From this point on, all runs we discuss are playing on the PS2 version of the game. After his run, Ricky went back to Jack 3. Ricky's heart will always belong to Jack 3. It's the siren song that steers the sailor astray. Throughout all this time, there had yet to be a runner whose intent was to make Jack 2 their sole focus. Ben and Laponia left as soon as they came. Crash Pro didn't get his name from running Jack. Nobody else had stuck around to leave a large enough impact. Who could blame them? Jack 2 runs on life support, with a memory leak so bad it's more like a memory faucet. Its randomness and instability ward off even the most curious of spectators. Of the original trilogy, it also has the dubious distinction of being the longest any percent. However, a wise man once said, there's an ass for every seat, and Jack 2 was about to find a dedicated runner. DJ Tom Jack Tom Jack wasn't new to Jack 2 by any means. He had been posting segmented runs and glitch videos on his YouTube channel for years. Back then, he didn't stream. French is his first language, and his English was not the best. When he decided to try his hand at single segment runs, he arguably had more experience than almost anyone else playing at the time. On March 23, 2013, Tom Jack would set his first world record with the time of 129.12. Among the tricks and glitches Tom Jack added in were a yellow barrier skip that didn't require a death abuse, skipping the left side of Mars's tomb, and adding in restart warps. For the left side of Mars Tomb, it's possible for Jack to clip out of bounds using the jet board. By getting enough height and spinning in the air, you can clip into this pillar and get into this water beneath the ground. Clipping under the door and around the corner will allow you to pop up from the water and ride the jet board to the start of Daxter's chase. This is left tomb skip. Restart warps are pretty straightforward. At any point, the player can hit pause and opt to restart the mission they're on. Restarting the level has the added benefit of placing you at or near the start of the level. With these tricks at his disposal, Tom Jack improved his time to 125.49 on May 19th. A few months later, Ricky decided to give Tom Jack a run for his money and jumped back in to contest. In short order, Ricky achieved a 124.47. Time. 
124 48 world fucking record Tom Jack was a highly skilled runner whose focus was on playing Jack 2. While Ricky was never as invested in playing Jack 2 as he was Jack 3, he was still Ricky. We have chronicled Ricky's speedrunning activities so much, we might be qualified to write his biography. If there's one thing that we've learned, it's that Ricky is really damn good at speedrunning. Tom Jack responded just under two weeks later with a 124.11 before Ricky took the record back with a 122-21. This back and forth is a testament to both players' skills. Tom Jack is brilliant when it comes to Jack 2, and Ricky is good enough to hold his ground against a player as talented as him. This period of time is defined almost entirely by optimization and skill. Apart from the occasional added trick, the route had remained the same for a while. Ricky was ready to put the game down and move on to other interests. This left improving the time to one man. The ferocious Frenchman, Tom Jack, quite frankly, flattened Jack too. Tom Jack had lowered the record by almost 7 minutes, improving his time 11 times over 15 months. The further he pushed the time, the more the run became about improvement and optimization, as opposed to new tech and strats. Like, the way I see it is it's like, Jack 2 is a game where you just, you're optimizing traveling through the city, getting to the missions, and you're optimizing the missions, missions themselves. Basically, every death brings you back to the beginning of the mission. So if you die, it's like a, it's basically a reset. So you can never die. So you want to be good enough to not die. And then you want to do it optimally in a way that like you, you save your ammo. There was skips, but they, they're not like as crazy as they are now. There's like the one skip in the very beginning where you skip the entire game pretty much. But then after that, it's just, they're really minor skips. Guess who's back? Back again. Ricky's back. Tell a friend. Reminding everyone that he is always within eyeshot, Ricky gets a record by one second. 1.14.49. Oh my god! No! One second! I did it! Oh my god! I don't believe that. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I just... I just got the world record. I just got the world record. Oh! <laughs> Oh man, holy shit, oh my god. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Rixer is back. By incorporating a reset warp on the way to Palace, farming ammo for the Peacemaker at Protect Samos, and getting the official first five hit Praxis fight, Ricky was able to wrest the record away from Tom Jack. Tom Jack would certainly reclaim the record in short order, but in a time where his dominance of the game was undisputed, Ricky was able to sneak in a one-second world record. A trick found by Ababob was going to help Tom Jack raise the bar even higher. By diving into a spot where Jack gets stuck in his diving animation, 
You can press X just after to launch like a proxy to get over the wall. With this, Tom Jack gets two records in one day with factory ABBA bounce, 114.16 and 113.15. Let's take a brief pause for the cause. There had been a runner who had managed to stay a step behind Tom Jack this whole time. Meet Vazer. Vazer had started running Jack 2 in late 2013, shortly after Tom Jack's ascent up the leaderboard. For quite a while, it felt like the only two runners dedicated to Jack 2 were Tom Jack and Vazer. Unlike many runners who pick up a game in tandem, there was virtually no communication between the two. Tom Jack speaks French, and his English wasn't the best. The best method of communication was through watching what the other person did and trying to replicate and improve upon it. He, his English wasn't that good, which is probably one of the reasons why he didn't really speak much to people, but I, I basically learned by just watching his runs really carefully and stuff like that. On occasion, Tom Jack was able to accurately communicate his feelings to the other runners. Tom Jack, Vazer, and Ricky were the best that Jack 2 had to offer. While they had taken the run pretty far, the run had grown a little stagnant. Most of the new tricks that were being added in were things that the runners had known about for a while that only served to make the speed run more difficult. That's when something major was discovered. Something so big, it would change the course of the run forever. This is Hovers. The ability to avoid all of Jack 2's problems by simply taking flight was huge. To say that it came from an unlikely source was an understatement. Unreal, an under-the-radar glitch hunter making videos on YouTube, said they found something big. The story goes is that he was just mashing buttons one day and he found it. And he actually sent he sent me and the Rixer a message on Twitch. And he was like, oh, I found this thing. I can like infinitely fly and like kind of have because no one had heard about this guy before um, within our context. So it was kind of like dismissed slash. Oh, no, here we go. Another thing. And a month later, he I don't think he had a video. I think it was just text of him just saying I found it. And then he got it a little bit more consistent and he made a video and it was public. And then there was no hiding it at that point. Like other people picked it up and they're like, why don't you tell us about this? And Here's how hovers work. In Jack 2, you can do tricks to build up speed like front flips and side flips. If you jump, do a left or right trick, and then immediately transition into an up or a down trick, it cancels the trick that you were doing previously and switches to the up or down trick. You can then repeat this up or down trick over and over by pressing L1, gaining height in the process. This will cause you to hover infinitely until you stop tricking. At the time, there was a little confusion surrounding what made it happen. Unreal wasn't sure either, since they had achieved liftoff via vague input meshing. A group of runners including Unreal, Bill Braid, Yankee 027, Super Mo 1985, and Nitrovsky eventually developed an understanding of how they worked. Nitrovsky came up with the buffered input strategy that is still used to this day. Holding L1 during the full hover start sequence, then doing half a left or right trick, and then a full up or down trick buffers the trick and makes it consistent. If you were to push all the way up or down on the stick before repressing L1, it would cause the start of the hover to fail. The comments were filled with people in and about the Jack community in awe of what they were seeing. The video itself was the tip of a rather large iceberg. Runs without hovers were now categorized as any percent hoverless. If you're interested in what this speed run would look like had it progressed without hovers, hoverless is a very interesting run to watch. New tricks always bring about new runners, and hovers were no different. While the old run was unstable and random, 
and unforgiving, hovers were exactly what new players were looking for to jump in. Hovers didn't fix what turned people off of Jack 2, it sort of just swept those issues under the rug. Tom Jack had been actively practicing and playing since hovers were found, but had yet to string a full run together. On December 6th, he started up another run. Escape, Barrier Skips, and Mars Tomb Skip are like second nature at this point. On right tomb, Tom Jack gets out of bounds and uses a hover to get up to the tombstone room, the very last section of right tomb. After a decent praxis, Tom Jack hovers back up to the exit 51 seconds ahead. With a few ups and downs along the way, Tom Jack gets a gold split on Peacemaker to keep him 50 seconds ahead. This run could go the distance and be a huge improvement over his previous time. 35 minutes into the run, and he's still holding his lead strong. On the mission Rescue Lurkers, Tom Jack fails the mission and has to start it over again. One of the lurkers fell into the water, and unfortunately, lurkers can't swim. By the time the last lurker is escorted to safety, Tom Jack is now 20 seconds behind. Under any other circumstances, this would be a reset, but that was before hovers. Hovers are the solution to Jack's various and sundry problems, but things aren't looking good. By the end of Drill Platform, he's over a minute behind with only a few splits left. Tom Jack uses a hover on Palace, which stops the bleeding, but he's still 33 seconds behind. When you find yourself down, all you can do is take a deep breath, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and start all over again. Don't lose your confidence if you slip. Tom Jack gathers his composure and hovers all the way to the robot fighting Cruise Factory. Just like that, he's almost 27 seconds ahead again, only for him to lose all of it on the crew fight itself. He keeps it close on the next few splits, but he's running out of time to make it up. On Protect Samos, he's only half a second off PB. If his goal was to tie it, that'd be swell. Back in the green after Metalhead Nest, it was time for the final fight. With a practiced hand, Tom Jack makes short work of core and ends the fight with a 10 second gold split, 1.13.05, the first world record with hovers. This run isn't the cinematic narrative payoff you might have hoped it would be. As we keep reiterating, Jack 2 is a cruel mistress. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. A month ago, failing lurkers and a bad crew fight would have both been resets. But hovers save so much time, any run by any one could potentially be the new record. And that's where our next runner comes in. Nitrovsky had come over to Jack 2 from the Spyro scene, having been a world record contender in Spyro 2 100% and Spyro 3 117%. Nitrov had been among the group who helped break down how hovers worked. He had started running shortly before hovers had been found which put him in prime position to potentially procure the prized world record. Nitroff didn't waste any time getting to work. Nitroff used the hovers on Tom Jack's 11305, as well as adding in a few more on Fortress, Life Seed, and Destroy Eggs. On December 9th, Nitroff brought it home with a 11249. Both runners were getting a feel for these tricks, and the amount of time they could save overall they had yet to really scratch the surface. By using a better hover setup on Life Seed and cleaning up his gameplay overall, Tom Jack reclaimed the record a few days later with a time of 1.11.41. By this point, the bloom was off the rose. The novelty had worn off. The runners who came to do a few runs of Jack 2 had returned back to their old haunts. However, Nitrovsky caught the wave at the right time and was keen on writing it out. Nitrov and Tom Jack were going to slug it out to see who was the last man standing.
The story, as the leaderboards would have you believe, declares Tom Jack the victor. However, this was a double knockout. Tom Jack had burnt out after his nearly two-year grind of the game. At his best, he was nearly unstoppable. An irresistible force drawing him to play Jack 2 on a near daily basis. The grind took its toll, as it does to nearly everyone. At the end of the day, the only one who is truly undefeated is Father Time. Nitroff was happy with his time, and was content to move on to other categories and games. The opening left by the absence of the game's top players created an opportunity for some of the other runners to steal the spotlight. These runners included Vazer and Unreal. Vazer had been running the whole time, and was one of the people that Unreal reached out to when he discovered Hovers. Unreal had been running as well as glitch hunting. Flames that burn as bright as Tom Jack's suck all the oxygen out of the room. Now that he had moved on, these two finally had some room to breathe and leave their own mark on history. Vazer got a 108-23 on February 17th, 2015. Unreal followed up shortly thereafter with a 108-21. The two weren't rivals or competitors. They were friends who enjoyed playing the game. Yeah, Unreal, like he obviously found the tricks. So that was that was good. But um he was a really good runner and like he was a pretty good friend too. Like I didn't really have a close relationship with anybody from the community until Unreal came around and like around the time where we were going back and forth, it felt really good because it didn't feel like a rivalry or anything like that. It just like we were helping each other over the next few months, a few new tricks would make their way into the speedrun. In Unreal's 108.21, a new trick was used shortly after Life Seed. The game breaks up sections of the map with airlocks. It was meant to help create a seamless environment and hide the fact the game has to load in that area. By hovering over the airlock coming back from Life Seed, none of the NPCs or vehicles will be loaded in, making it a ghost town. Not only is it faster than going through the airlock, it's also easier to move through the city without any of the NPCs in the way. Unreal used this as well to achieve a 107.37 not long after. In Vazer's 105.56, a reroute is added. Throughout the game's history, players had gone back and forth on what the optimal order to do the missions in the middle of the game was. These missions included Life Seed, Destroy Eggs, Rescue Lurkers, Drill Platform, and Protect Samos. The Lurker mission is a bit out of the way. By starting Lurkers first, runners could leave to do Destroy Eggs, then do Drill Platform, and then do a Restart Warp to go back to Lurkers. This would save time, but it would also make the run a lot more difficult. If you died at any point during the sequence, you would lose the Lurker storage and respawn where you died. For new runners, this trick was low risk, high reward. For experienced runners, failing meant you would have to take the 60 to 90 second drive of shame back to the lurker mission to start it again. In Unreal's 105.16, Unreal uses a hover to get up to the Peacemaker faster. See, not all the tricks in this game are difficult to explain. In Vazer's 104.13, by clipping out of bounds by the door to Underport, you could punch board down into a semi-loaded Underport, then hover over to Sig, which skips the need for the mech suit. An improved version was later found that involved a curved jet board jump to deload the city instead of going out of bounds. In Unreal's 102.53, another ghost town was found on the way back from Mountain Temple. Skipping the airlock causes none of the NPCs to load in, and life is easier when nobody is around. Before we continue, we need to rewind a little bit. One of the things that is often overlooked are the people that these runners inspire along the way. Someone had found Ricky's videos in Nitrovsky's stream. They immediately caught the itch. And I found the Rixer, and this was back in like 2015. And his videos were all over the place. He was big into Jack speedrunning. And I watched his Jack 2 run, and I was like, wow, this is insane. Just the first level, Escape. I was like, the fact that you can beat Escape in about a minute is ridiculous to me. So that got me into it immediately. I had the game, I had the console still. And I was like, wow, this is really fun. I wonder if anybody's live streaming this. And I looked up 
uh, Jack 2 and the person that was streaming right then was Nitrovsky. And I would just watch him like all the time. So <laughs> he was just always playing Jack 2. And um, I think I rem it's funny thinking back now, a very specific day when he was streaming Jack 2, he he had like issues that day playing the game. And I think he was stuck in escape for like six hours straight. And I was just in glee, just watching, just happy. I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. He's so good at the game. And he just never left the state <laughs> that whole day. So that was a funny moment. But it didn't matter. I didn't care about like any skill gap. I was just like enjoying speedrunning. Ouija was no stranger to competition. He had competed several times at the highest level of Kendama, a much more complicated ball and cup toy. Pressure was an old friend. Around the time of Unreal's 107, Ouija had worked his PB down to a 108. Ouija decided to put the game down to try his hand at Jack 1. If you haven't watched our video on Jack 1, you should add it to your watch later playlist. After tying the world record in Jack 1, Ouija decided to give Jack 2 another shot. Honing his craft and sharpening his skills in the original game, Ouija was definitely skilled enough, but more than that, Ouija had a brand new mindset. I, I kind of had this new mindset in how to play a game competitively, and Vazor and Unreal didn't really push the times like, like insanely down to like sub uh, one minute some of best or anything crazy. Like Jack Two had a lot of improvement still, so I was like, okay, I gotta hit this now, and capitalize on the moment he did. Ouija achieved a 102.49 on April 24th, 2016. Oh! <laughs> All right. Time for Vazor to come back, boys. At the end of Destroy Tower, the communicator will pop up and talk to you. While it's talking, you can't use the portal to leave. By skipping the cutscene on a slight delay and making a beeline for the portal, you could get through the portal before the communicator started talking to you. This trick was made easier by playing in a language other than English, because the communicator section lags in other languages. While Ouija's pop-off would predict Vazor would make his return to any percent, it would actually be Unreal who returned. A few months after Ouija's run, Unreal brought home the bacon with a 102.27. It was around this time that a new skip was incorporated into the run, Robot Skip. On your way to fighting crew, you're dropped into an area where you're intended to fight these robotic enemies. By hovering up to a checkpoint, breaking the breakable floor, and then hitting the death plane of the crew fight, you can skip having to fight robots. One of the first world records to feature Robot Skip was by Pickleberry. Piggle is a prolific Jack 1 runner perhaps most well known for their 100% runs. At the start of 2017, Piggle got a 10207 on January 3rd. As foretold by Ouija, Phaser would return and achieve one final any percent world record time. 10145 on January 11th. Vazor hung around and played other categories at a high level well into 2018, but never again found himself a top castle any percent. To hear him tell it, it wasn't some sort of dramatic exit. And I stopped around 2018, apparently. Mid-2018. I can't believe the years when I look back at it. Like, how I've felt the last 3-4 years is like, oh, I need to get back to playing the game. <laughs> and then when I look at these years, I'm like, oh, it's been so long since I haven't played the game. <laughs> After Piggle got a 101.22 in February, things started to slow down. Many of the runners who were active in the past three years were off doing other things. With nobody actively pushing the time lower, there was a window of opportunity for someone else to rise above the rest. That someone was Sikinar. Siki had started running the game in August of 2016, they slowly started climbing their way up the leaderboard. The same day that Piggle had gotten his 101.22, Siki had achieved a time of 103.44. Sixth place on the leaderboard was nothing to slouch at. It was around this time that submissions had opened up for SGDQ 2017. Nothing gets runners inspired more than the possibility of running their game on Speedrunning's grandest stage. 
There are countless examples throughout history of runners going further than they thought possible to bring the best showing of their speed game to bear. And like so many other runners before them, Siki got the bug. Yeah, and I, honestly, I, I would say that GDQ has this effect of really motivating someone to like, like I wanted to sort of present the best time I could when I was at GDQ. Determined to have the world record going into SGDQ, Siki put the axe to the grindstone. The next few months saw them improve slowly but surely. It wasn't going to be easy, but nothing ever worth having is. Yes! <laughs> yes! Dude! Yes! Yes! Whoa. Huh. What? Wait, what? <laughs> I was ahead? What the fuck was this run? <laughs> After two months, Siki's hard work finally paid off. They could say they were going into GDQ with the world record in hand. But SGDQ wasn't until July, so why stop here? Nearly every runner up until this point had something new introduced into the run that helped them save time. Ricky had barrier skips and life seed jump. Tom, Jack, and Nitrovsky had hovers. Vazor and Unreal had a smattering of skips to work in. Piggle had robot skip. Siki had nothing. There were no new tricks and no new time saves to add in, which makes this grind so special. The game had become about micro-optimizations and city movement. If high-level SM64 runners are defined by their castle movement, high-level Jack 2 runners were now going to need better city movement. Where else was there to go? On June 30th, Siki started up another run. Things are starting off alright. Siki is keeping up with their PB, albeit a full second behind. In Mars Tomb, they get some poor luck on the tombstone section, losing them even more time. But not to worry. After a nice Praxis fight, Siki's back in the green. Once out of the tomb, Siki starts saving time on the missions. Rescue at Fortress and Sewer Rescue go really well, jumping them ahead to minus 27. With luck like this, they might be able to break the curse on Get Life Seed. For whatever reason, this mission has been giving them trouble. This time, though, they're gonna play it safe. This is the farthest I've ever gotten with a pace like this. That's good. On their way to the Haven Palace, their Zoomer explodes. They're able to recover and ride the jet board the rest of the way, but now they're nervous. Getting to crew, Siki's hands are shaking, and each hover is followed by a sigh of relief. They know they're losing time, but they skip the next few splits so they don't have to think about it. After the crew fight, they're slowly bleeding time. They still have about 20 seconds to play with though, but as they're heading to the final fight, they fail the last hover and take a death. It's not the end of the world, but they're on the verge of choking the run. What was once a 37 second lead over their best time is now only seven. It's just enough to get them over the next minute barrier. Siki finishes out the fight against Core and comes in at 1 hour and 53 seconds. <laughs> I'll be too proud of this roller too. <laughs> oh 
Oh my god, thanks guys. <laughs> Dude, all the copy pasta for sub 101. This has been my dream for so long. I thought I killed it right at the end, but we got a 43 core fight. No need to freak out. Oh, um, dude, I thought nerves killed it right at the end, but we got it. This run is the culmination of months of hard work and completed just a few days before SGDQ started. The stage was set for an awesome showing on the grandest stage that speedrunning has to offer. At the event, all of Siki's hard work and energy pays off. The estimate given was an hour and 12 minutes, a time in case everything that possibly could go wrong went wrong. Siki crushed that projected time and finished with a time of 102.59. And time. Barely okay. a 102. Was that, was that seriously a 102? Yeah. Wow. Nice. That beat my, I wanted to get a 104 if I could. So 102 is, is like, I'll take that. Um, yeah, that, I'm really happy with that run. Nothing really went wrong. I got all the big stuff um, in, the, in the game. Siki's SGDQ 2017 run is the type of showcase that many runners hope they'll have and seldom do. Siki got back to work and eventually lowered the record to a 1037 on September 19th. Afterwards, Siki moved on from Jack 2 Any% percent and focused on other categories in games like Link's Awakening DX and Ori in the Blind Forest. This Siki spring and summer was a scintillating speedrun showcase surpassing several star speedsters and ended in a superb SGDQ showing. I guess how I could say is definitely, um, I don't know if I truly like burned out on speedrunning per se. I guess um, extenuating circumstances kind of uh, affected my ability to contribute to the speedrunning world as, as much kind of moving on from there. And I guess I don't know how to like say it beyond that. I guess, but um, just just it wasn't it wasn't something I was able to prioritize as much past that. How good was this run? This run stood tall for longer than any previous world record. Siki's record remained atop the leaderboard for more than seven months. That's the longest gap between records since Ben Fichter to Ricky in 2012. Sub one hour was on the horizon. But how much magic was left in this old silk cat? Before we answer that, we need to take a brief detour. A few runners new to Jack 2 started making progress. Throughout the rest of 2017, they weren't gaining too much traction. Remember, this game is held together with chewing gum and toothpicks. It's a dull breeze away from crashing. It wouldn't be until 2018 that these fledgling runners would make some headway. These runners were Smoker 2G, Septurna, and headstrong. Smoker had previously done runs of Ocarina of Time and the Minish Cap before picking up Jack 2 not long after SGDQ 2017. Of our three newcomers, Smoker had the most immediate success, starting 2018 off with a time of 103.46, a little over three minutes off the record. We mentioned earlier how inspiration is contagious. Ricky and Nitrovsky had inspired a young Ouija to start running Jack 2. Septurna, also known as Lucas, had found Jack 2 through Ouija. So, yeah, he was like, he watched a lot of my runs at the time, like my 1 and 249, apparently he watched. And I thought that was funny because I found Jack 2 through uh, the Rixer, and now Lucas found Jack 2 through me. And it was just kind of like a, a domino effect of <laughs> new people finding speedruns. After seeing Ouija's 10249, Septurna was hooked. He spent weeks studying the run to learn as much as he possibly could from it. He watched that run from start to finish nearly a dozen times. Septurna had spent the end of 2017 playing the original Jack and Daxter. After getting times in no lava tube skip, no fire canyon skip, and orbless, Septurna set his sights on Jack 2. He ended 2017 with an any percent time of 108.40. Who knows? Maybe this Jack 2 thing would work out for Septurna. Lastly, Headstrong. After she was finished destroying Jack 1, she decided to take a break and focus on other interests. Despite not being interested in shooter games, she decided to offer a Jack 2 Twitch sub goal. 
in, I think it was 2017, I wanna say. Um, at the beginning of 2017, I did a sub goal for me to casually play Jack 2, which was met, I played Jack 2, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. I did not find the game very fun. I complained all the time. I did not like a lot of the mechanics in the game. And then we went on from there and I actually had a sub goal for Jack 3. I did that. I enjoyed Jack 3 a little bit more because it didn't have as quite as much badness to me as Jack 2 did, but I still didn't really care for it. And then my uh, masochist self decided to do a sub goal to do a trifecta. And then in secret, I spent two weeks with Siki. Siki taught me how to run Jack 2 and I actually spent only three hours with Jack 3 um, <laughs> the day before I did the run. And then while learning Jack 2, I actually found that I enjoyed the run of Jack 2. So that's kind of what got me started with running Jack 2, was that time I spent with Siki learning the run. And then from there, I ended up switching over to Jack 2 for a bit. And just, I, I ended up liking the game as a run. I hate the game casually. I love, I love it as a run. Headstrong had the most experience out of all the newest runners when it came to running Jack. Would her skills from the Precursor Legacy translate over to Jack Theft Auto? At the start of 2018, she was behind both Smoker and Septurna with a time of 1.10.52. In the Zoomer race missions, it was discovered that you could skip portions of each lap in the stadium races. By boosting while going up certain walls, you can get to the other side of it. Once you land, it'll count as though you've completed a lap, hence the name Lap Skips. By March 1st, the baby birds were out of the nest and soaring to new heights. Smoker was in 5th place with a 102.08, Septurna a few rungs below in ninth place with a 103.54, and last but not least, tied for 11th place was Headstrong with a 104.20. Determined to ruin the best PB in the history of speed docks, Headstrong kept on keeping on. While Smoker and Septurna were left hovering in place, Headstrong was zooming past them. She took her time all the way down to a 101.49. She seemed poised to be the one to pass Siki, and then Smoker woke up. In April, everything just started clicking into place. Attempts are all well and good, but you weren't going to PB without a little cooperation from the game. 101.42 on April 10th. Two days later, 101.32. 101.10 on the 15th. 101.02 on the 17th. Smoker was less than 30 seconds away from the summit. Headstrong answered back with a 1.036 on April 18th. You know what they say, the higher you climb, the air gets thinner. With two runners now within striking distance of the Slay Sicky sweepstakes, one person just needed to close the gap. In the end, Smoker edged out Headstrong and took the world record on April 19, 2018. Smoker had smote Sicky's sweet record. The real prize at stake wasn't to see who could beat Sicky, though. No, it was to see who could get the sub one. One of the knocks against Jack 2 was how long its any percent was. Beating Jack 2 in under an hour would be big. Who was it going to be? On April 29th, Headstrong started up another run. She's nearly 37 seconds off of sub 1, but her sum of best is 58.20. Anything is possible. A few small hiccups, like just missing clipping into the pillar to get into the left tomb, lose some time along the way. On Praxis, Headstrong gets a sub 8 Praxis. No world record has ever finished the opening salvo of tricks and glitches that fast. Not long after, she's back to being nearly even with her splits. With solid performance from Sewer Escort to the Errol race, she finds herself 14.7 seconds ahead. On Drill Platform, disaster strikes. As Headstrong says, That's, that's a lot of time loss on this split. There's always gotta be one bad split, I guess. This is the part of her run where the real-time save starts, though. On Lurker Rescue, she manages to save 5 seconds. In the Class 2 race, she saves 0.6 seconds. On Explore Palace, 
a split aptly named Angry Face, she gets an 11 second gold. Her best time is 59.29, but she needs to save more time if she's going to snag the first sub hour. Hope seems lost after a disappointing carrier and crew fight. Her best possible time is a 59.58.6, and she has 10 minutes left. She'd need to play perfectly. On Metalhead Arcade, Headstrong saves 13 seconds and ends up 30 seconds ahead. In her PB, she spammed Triangle and accidentally ended up taking the carrier back to Weapons Factory. The Whack-A-Mole split had stolen all of her time save, and she wanted it back. Unfortunately, the Sub-1 dies in Underport, a miss we can blame on Sig and his chonky horse legs. So no Sub-Hour, but a PB is still possible. Going into the final split, she's about 28 seconds ahead. She expertly hovers over to the core fight, with a high jump thrown in for added swag. The core fight goes really well, and she winds up with a 9.19 second gold. Her final time? 59.59, the first sub hour. Headstrong was the first person to ever beat Jack 2 in under an hour. She did so three years after she was also the first person to beat Jack and Daxter in under an hour. You'll find no shortage of awards and accolades in Headstrong's trophy case, but achieving this feat in both games is really something special. After this, Headstrong took a little break from Mini% percent to get the records in Hoverless and all missions. Smoker took a break too. Where was Septurna in all of this? Not long after this, he achieved his goal of getting a one hour flat time and decided to move on to other categories like Hoverless. Earlier, we said that Hoverless is what any percent would look like if hovers were never found. Playing the category would only serve to sharpen Septurna's skills for his inevitable any percent return. In return he did. On July 7th, he attained his first world record time of 59.48. We would like to take this time to reiterate that, aside from race lap skips, the run has seen no new tricks or route changes in over two years. It sounds cliche, but the run was almost entirely centered around small optimizations and time saves. Take turns tighter, perform tricks faster, make as few mistakes as possible. Only a few days later, Smoker tied Headstrong's time with a 59.59 of their own. This disturbance in the Force was enough for Jedi Master Headstrong to put down all missions and return to any percent. A month after Septurna's PB, Headstrong had PB'd twice. First, a 59.19 on August 7th, and then a 59.05 less than a day later. Later, in August, Headstrong had a run that was looking like it was going to be a sub-59. While Kor was taking the brunt of her blaster to the face, this happened. What? <laughs> That's just the way it goes when you play Jack 2. Not long after this, Septurna improved the record to a 58-54 and Headstrong got a much better sub-59 with a time of 58.33. Headstrong had accomplished so much in such a small period of time, she was content to move on to something else. Pokemon Let's Go Eevee is a hell of a drug. Who can say no to that little face? Smoker had dropped out of the running shortly after his 59.59. That meant that Septurna was the last one standing. When it comes to Jack 2, he was about to craft his own legacy. A legacy of absolute dominance over this game. I fucking did it! I fucking did it, man! I fucking did it! I fucking did There's no fucking way!
There's no fucking way, dude. There's no fucking way, dude. There's no fucking Yes, dude, let's fucking go. Holy fuck. Let's fucking go, man. Fuck. Oh my god! Oh. Dude! One X, dude! One fucking X, dude! But Lucas was somebody that was like, just so good at this game and put so much time into this game for so long that his skill gap was so much further than anybody else's yeah so septurna is very 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 dedicated to whatever they do so in this case with jack 2 if they wanted a time they got the time no matter how long it took no matter how many hours it took just if they wanted it they wanted it it was yeah, to, to, to the point where it was just like, you knew that Septurna would get a time if Septurna mentioned, I want this time. <laughs> yeah, so Jack 2 has never been the most popular of the series, not a single time. The most popular it had been was during the sub one time. Outside of that, the games never really had dedicated runners for it until Septurna. Subterna was the first person to dedicate just to Jack 2. Well, yeah, other than Tom Jack. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, yeah, the era of Tom Jack and then the era of Subterna. For the first time in 14 months, something new was added into the run. And by something new, we actually mean something old. If you remember, runners were able to skip the communicator talking to them at the end of Destroy Tower by playing in a different language. It turns out, if you play with no speech volume, the communicator doesn't even pop up. Problem solved. And that's not all. By now, you've no doubt seen runners jump spin in the air and fire their blaster. Doing this shoots out five shots in somewhat random directions. It was discovered that if you jump spin, input to pull out the blaster, then input to pull out the peacemaker and hold R1 before hitting the ground, it will instead charge the peacemaker five times and make a large peacemaker shot. This was very useful in the crew fight. The first two phases each require three peacemaker shots, and the last phase requires four. After shooting him twice in phase two, runners could then overcharge the peacemaker to shoot five shots and skip the final phase. This trick, found by Geta92, saved roughly 30 seconds. On February 25th, Septurna starts up another run. Like the ebb and flow of the tides, Septurna's run goes from being in the green, then in the red, and then back to being in the green. By the end of Destroy Eggs, he's 9.6 seconds ahead. By the end of Rescue Lurkers, 17.8 seconds ahead. The magic continues all the way through to crew, before he loses 10 seconds in the crew fight. But Septurna is playing better than anyone else has in the history of this game. The consistency and execution on display are second to no one. In a run defined by instability and RNG, Septurna manages to make it look easy. Before the final fight, he's 21.4 seconds ahead. This could be a massive PB. He's been at Core plenty of times. Compared to the other tricks and missions in the game, Core is a pushover. And yet, with the first 55 minute time at stake, at the end of a run where Septurna played out of his mind, his nerves got the better of him. Core is bullying him. He's choking now. The clock's running out. Time's up, over, blow. Septurna bled time on Core, but it was still enough to eke out the first sub-56, a 55-58. Yes! Oh my god! <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> no! 
fuck it, dude. I fucking choked everything at tour, but fuck it. Aside from a little spaghetti in the crew and core fights, this run was pretty much perfect. Anyone who wanted to challenge this run was going to have to play out of their minds. When you when I watched his 55, and I was just like, this dude just has a task run, like a perfect run. I've never seen somebody not mess up in Jack 2 because Jack 2 is a game that you can easily mess up in, in any part. But like this whole thing of Septurna here was like, the longest and hardest grind of any of the grinds for anyone. Septerna was by themselves the whole time, just slamming the record down with that nonstop. <laughs> but this specifically the 5558 was like, it's the equivalent of where the run is now, just without the new stuff. Septerna wouldn't have been able to do all of this alone. Were it not for the community, he might not have done it at all. I mean, the main thing on why I like got these times is because of the community. Like, I, I really gotta like point that out. Like, I, I would have not gotten those times, especially without Headstrong. Like, Headstrong, like, she, she just kept me up, like, in my head to like not lose it completely. Like, especially Headstrong, I feel like thanked the most um, out of all people, especially when it comes to the Jack 2 grind. This record stood longer than any other record had in the modern era. Septurna was on a whole nother level. Nobody came close for the remainder of 2020, and almost the entirety of 2021. For many of the other games we've covered, there was an increase in speedrun activity during lockdown. But not for Jack 2. Even accomplished runners weren't optimistic. I thought Lucas's run was so good to the point where it just wasn't even worth like playing any percent again. Uh, I was just like a really competitive person. I liked to try to do something as perfect as I possibly can, but I kind of believe that I could not beat Lucas ever or anybody would. Without something new, this record might just stand uncontested through to the end of this video, but you have the benefit of knowing how much of the video is left and know that something big was going to be found. Ladies and gentlemen, Daxter Chase Skep. In Mars Tomb, there's a section where Daxter is chased by a giant boulder. It's pretty slow, and nobody likes playing as an ocelot. By doing left tomb skip, you can skip all of the left side of Mars Tomb up until you get chased by the boulder. You get chased first by a boulder, and then you get chased by a giant spider. But you can skip all of this. The first part of the skip is the same. You can get down to where the Daxter chase starts by clipping into a pillar near the left tomb. By doing a very precise roll jump, you could roll from out of bounds into that section. There's water and dark eco just outside the walls. You can ground pound in a way that causes Jack to fall diagonally and have him hit the water just as he's hitting the dark eco. This causes the invulnerability glitch. There are two parts to the invulnerability glitch. When you have part one, you can't interact with anything. You can't get hurt, but nobody knows you exist either. No cutscenes, no zoomers, nothing works. But if you manage to take damage while you're invulnerable, you can get part two. Part two keeps you from taking damage and allows you to interact with everything. Cutscenes work, enemies notice you, everything works. But how do you take damage when you're invulnerable? The only way is by taking fall damage. By being in the dark eco and then jumping and ground pounding into the room where the Daxter chase is, that gives you fall damage, which gives you part two, allowing you to start the cutscene. Invulnerability transfers over when you're playing as Daxter, which allows you to go around the boulder meant to be chasing you and hide in this corner. Once the spider comes over to you and is up against Daxter, you just jump in place. Due to how spiders are meant to interact with Daxter, this turns you back into Jack. From here, you can do another out of bounds and hover to the halfway point of the spider chase, which is where the game has a trigger for ending the chase sequence. Hitting the trigger skips having to do the chase. This saves about 45 seconds. Daxter chase skip is one of the biggest tricks to have been found since Mars Tomb Skip, and it is by far the hardest. Sure. 
This trick saves 45 seconds, but you have to carry that time save through to the end of the run. Who among you can say that you can play lights out perfectly for an hour? It's a tall order to ask of anyone in any game, and at any given point, the game might just crash on you, no matter what you do. This trick was found towards the end of the summer in 2021. A runner from the past was considering making a comeback, but so much had changed in the time between records, there was a lot to consider. But that was at the same time, I think it was the end of the summer, I got an internship at Intel. And I was like, okay, but I am working 40 hours a week now. Like, I almost have no free time to even do this. Like, uh, I still have other things to worry about. I have to pay rent and do all these adult things. And now, am I really trying to like, push myself into the most competitive mindset again as uh, when I had infinite free time back in the day. So I was in a totally different environment and circumstance. And I was like, okay, I'll just, I'll try it. Ouija knew that Daxter Chase Skip was not going to be enough by itself. The skill gap between Septurna and Ouija was too great. Ouija was going to need something else in order to break through. And after a little searching, Ouija found a skip called Shaft Skip. Shaft Skip was a way to get from Underport all the way to Defense Stadium without driving. There's an elevator that you can load when you go up to the palace, and across the map, another elevator that takes you down into the Defense Stadium part of the city. By hovering from one elevator to the other, you can fall back down and skip half the map. This trick would be enough, however, it only seemed to work on the PS3 version of the game. Whenever Ouija tried on PS2, the game would hardlock when he tried to enter Defense Stadium. After some tweaking, Ouija found a version that would work. By using a zoomer to drive up a ramp into the tomb out of bounds, you can keep the zoomer under the map. That way, you don't have to start off a slow hover or slow side flip. If you went too fast, you'd get there before the door can load in. By angling the hover perfectly, you could grind the side of this little ledge that would set the angle perfectly to land next to the elevator. Landing inside would prevent you from leaving the elevator, so you had to be sure to land right next to it. Landing next to it would cause you to fall down. You have to hover extremely high because the loading trigger is near the top of the elevator. This loads the area and you can fall outside the map and then leave. This was it. This extra 15 seconds would be enough to take down Septurna. So with the introduction of two really hard tricks, Ouija had his work cut out for him. 45 seconds of that time save he would have to carry from the start of the run to the end. He had a good mindset, he had the technical skill, and he had a clear goal in mind. It took him a little over a month, but he had done it. Hours and hours of hard work for this moment. On October 17th, Ouija beat Septurna, 55-46. Easy, easy. When it comes down to the nerves, it's easy, man. Ah. If you control the nerves, I can get it. I just happened to get it right then. I was feeling good. I hit chat, I hit splits, I was like, I just have to play consistent throughout. Not mess with anything. 4x too, that's great. Whew. The last run of the day. Thanks everyone. Glad you all could witness this. Septurna wasted no time jumping back into Jack 2. Someone had taken his record, and he wasn't going to stop until he got it back. Since Ouija had used new tricks in order to beat him, Septurna got right to work learning Daxter Chase Skip and Shaft Skip. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I didn't actually like want to play the game that much, but uh, <laughs> I saw the time saves and I was like, okay, this is like almost a minute of time save. Let's just do a few runs like to see how it goes and stuff. And I uh, started to practice the skips for like a couple hours and I got pretty good at, at them uh, pretty quickly. 
Three days later, Saturna got a 5539. A day after that, 5534. On October 24th, a 5529, and then a 5456. Having not played any percent since the start of 2020, Saturna had returned to form in short order and taken care of business. His 5456 was every bit as perfect as his 5558, with the new tricks added in. And then um, Lucas came back, actually. He came back out of hiding, or out of retirement, or wherever he was. And he's like, okay, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to add Shaft Skip in, and I'm going to add Daxter Chase Skip, but at my skill level. Like, I'm, he, he pretty much did the same exact run as his 55 that he had before, but he added that 45 seconds, and he added that 15 second time save. And within like a week, I think, he got a 54. And granted, that was like his best run that he's ever had. Like nothing went wrong. There were no mistakes really. There was very, very small mistakes. He had great RNG and he just didn't mess anything up. And I was like, when I saw that, I was like, oh my God. Like I thought I was getting better at the game. I have so much to get better at. So now I was about a minute behind him again. This run was daunting, but Ouija would find the motivation to keep pushing on. No time stands forever, no matter how great of a runner they are. But once again, Ouija found himself a minute behind Zepterna. Something we have not discussed are differences between PS2s. Ouija was playing on a 70k, or a PS2 whose model number started with 7-0. Septurna was playing on a later model, which had slightly faster loading speeds, a 90k. Using a 90k saves about 10 seconds in loads alone. And it's not just loading, the 90k was better equipped to handle Jack 2, which means that the 70k crashes more. Without even picking up the controller, Ouija is at a huge disadvantage against Septurna. To best Septurna, Ouija was going to have to re-examine his strategy. I actually backed off for a bit. I stopped doing full runs and I decided, okay, there's something in Kendama where you're doing a bunch of tricks, you're doing a combination of tricks. And if you wanna do that combo correctly, you have to learn each part and make sure you perfect each part. So I was like, okay, what's my worst part of the game? It's the end game. I always lose time on the end game because it's the hardest part of the game. So I practiced end game until I felt like my run was coming to almost like a perfect end game, like the best end game you can get. Lucas's run in end game was like a 1730 something. And I was like, okay, if I reach a 1730, I might gain confidence enough to possibly beat it. Ouija began ironing out the wrinkles in his game slowly yet surely. To hell with single segment speed runs, practice each segment individually. Once his time started to rival Septurna's, he garnered the confidence to grind for the world record. While he was looking for even more small strats he could use to lower the world record, Ouija found something during the Class 2 race. Runners had known about a way to skip laps during these races for a long time, but the lap skip was at the end of the track. Ouija had found one a lot earlier by doing it on this little ledge. The best IL time for Class 2 was around 1 minute 24 seconds at the time. After Ouija found the new spot, he was able to take the IL record down to a 119. This small time save might not seem like a lot, but Septurna and Headstrong's Class 2 races clock in closer to a minute 30. This was potentially 10 seconds Ouija could use to level the playing field. Now it was time to put it all together in a run. On December 14th, Ouija got a 54.57, one second off from Septurna's run. He was so close, he could almost taste it. Ouija had come this far. How hard would that last step really be? Every day after that, he started getting runs that were on world record pace, sometimes multiple times a day. Almost all of them ended in the same place, the game crashing in Metalhead Arcade. As soon as he left, the game would crash. The few times that didn't happen, he'd get to construction site and he would crash there. 
He was playing better than anyone else had in the history of the game, but its console was still holding him back. Ouija was doing everything possible to get past the memory issues. Pausing, animal sacrifices, zooming in. By select pausing for two seconds before the door opened, Ouija would never crash. These two seconds might not seem like a lot, but don't forget, he's only one second off the world record as it is. After weeks of the game dropping dead on the home stretch, Ouija took home the gold. 54-49. Oh my god, no. No way. I, I got a 40, I got a 49. That's a 49 for sure. Fuck yeah. Ah, oh, why did I have to, why did I have to lose that, that, that hover man? That was my last try too. Big dubs! We did it! He is a, he's a scary runner. <laughs> he's very, he's very good. Rigi, uh, Ouija, like, when I got the, when we went for 54 and stuff, that's like the same feeling I had when me and Headstrong and Smoker went for like 59, 58, kinda, the big numbers. And I was really happy for him, because he, uh, he played a lot as well. Like, he played way more than I did, for sure. But he's, he's just a great guy, absolutely. As 2022 rolled around, a Jack 2 Any% percent tournament was underway. Every great anime needs a tournament arc, right? Nothing sparks community togetherness like a good old-fashioned tourney. Old runners from the past, as well as new runners, all rattled off PBs. Smoker 2G was back on the grind. Prominent Jack 1 runners Outrageous Josh and Pickleberry got solid PBs as well. Even Ricky fooled around and got a new personal best. The field was stacked, and as many people were playing now as they had at any other point in the game's history. With all the fervor around the game, it was only a matter of time before someone started playing hot. Sometimes, speedrunners get the itch to run their games at odd times or off hours. Instead of setting up to stream for a while, some runners opt to do offline runs. No splits, no layout, no camera. Just the runner and their game. This runner in particular was just randomly in the mood to play Jack. That's when they got this run. Of course, things start off alright. The Praxis fight goes well, leaving the first part of the run in 6 minutes and 48 seconds. When leaving the tomb though, the runner drops the hover to the exit. On the second try though, they bring it back by getting the elusive Ghost Town glitch on this section. As the run goes on, there are some close calls, like the first race lap skips almost failing, and third try on the life seed hover, but this runner is taking it in stride. Drill Platform and Lurker's Rescue go especially well, more than making up for any slip-ups so far. On top of that, the crew fight puts them well ahead, and it's a good thing too. Coming out of Underport, poor RNG strikes. There are no one-seater zoomers in the area, so they go at the jet board for longer than they'd wish. But that's not all. After clipping into Defend Stadium, they immediately get sniped by the enemy, twice. Getting stun-locked like this, the runner is losing precious time and health. Back on the jet board, they keep on trucking. The bad luck doesn't stop there. On the way to construction site, Jack is body blocked by the horde of enemies. At this point, the run feels dead in the water, but we've come this far. Might as well finish it out to see what we get. The runner unloads on core. The final time, 54-47. Was it the OG Ricky? Did Septurna unretire to take what was rightfully his? Did Ouija, in defiance of his console's well-defined limitations, improve his PB? Did Outrageous Josh drop an outrag yeehaw on the rest of the leaderboard? No. This was none other than Headstrong. Headstrong had been grinding for months after Ouija had stopped playing. She had changed the way she was approaching the game after the tournament to be more focused and methodical. 
The overall experience of preparing and participating in the tournament gave her the confidence to keep pushing. Instead of resetting constantly, she was trying to continue more runs. She was doing something she had never done before. Offline attempts. Just listening to music and relaxing, and this run just sort of came together. Her new mentality paid off, and this is where the record stands today. From March 18th to April 3rd, I was grinding every single day pretty consistently for like four to five hours a day leading into that run that happened offline. It was honestly, it was on a day where I just, I didn't really feel like streaming that day. So I decided not to stream and take a break from streaming. But like halfway through the day, I was like, you know what? Kind of want to play Jack. About an hour and a half into attempts, that run happened, again, as I mentioned, fully out of the blue. Like, I wasn't expecting anything to happen because it had been like a month prior of trying to get things going. And it was just, again, it just didn't really hit me until more recently, I guess, just how much went into getting that. Jack 2's tumultuous tale is one of affection and resilience. For a game as wholly unforgiving as Jack 2, the game's history is filled with people who worked hard to work past its imperfections. You don't put that level of effort in unless you really love what you're doing and the people you're doing it with. Where do we go from here? The mother of all skips would be construction site skip, or skipping all the way to the penultimate level. This trick would functionally work the same as Mars Tomb, but it would be for the final area of the game. In a demo version released a month before the game's release, this trick actually works. It was patched in the month between the demo and the final version. Runners are hopeful that someday this skip might be found. Ouija was working on a task of Jack 2, but the task proved to be impossible because of desync issues. It's not solely a Jack 2 problem, PCSX2's task tools are not the best. Still, it's a fitting footnote for this problematic PlayStation gun game. The game is untassable, for now. Hope is not lost though. A group of passionate people that includes Water111, Vazer, Mandude, Zemus, and Dahlmeyer to name a few, have been working diligently on a PC port of the original game, Jack and Daxter. Once they have completed that, they may set their sights on a Jack 2 PC port. Not only would that make tasking possible, but it would allow runners to better understand the game's code and potentially find more tricks, skips, and glitches. We're sure this won't be the end of Jack 2's story. No matter how random the game is, no matter how many times it crashes, no matter how angry it makes people, someone will come along and pick up the torch. It's hard to see how the run can be improved right now, but they'll find a way. People always find a way. Hey, thanks for watching our video. If you want to join the community, check out our Discord. Also, consider supporting us on Patreon. It really helps. Thanks.